Uh, we encourage general audience participation, so if you hear some things that you like, shout here, here. If you hear some things you don't like, shout shame. Um, to point your attention to the orange return sheets on your chairs, uh, these go towards uh, the best speaker at the end of the year, so please hand them, please fill them out, and then please hand them to Mark and Cloda as you leave. And then just go for the speak speakers tonight, so on the proposition, we have Ron Rasuli, uh, Jody Ginsburg, Hugh McHenry, and Mark Flynn. Hi, good evening everyone, ladies and gentlemen, honorable chairs. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a general definition of what safe spaces are so you guys can get a general scope. Safe spaces are places or communities, either online or off, where bigotry and oppressive views are not tolerated. They're controlled insofar as they can be, where people can discuss and support one another in these issues. An alternative definition is that a movement which is arising is undirected and driven largely by students to scrub campuses clean of words, ideas, subjects, thoughts, and images which may give discomfort or offense. Safe spaces first appeared on campus in the 70s as women's centers. Back then, a safe space was, des was designated to protect a woman from physical harm, as well as helping with academic problems. Today, safe spaces have taken a much more ethereal and wider reaching role. They protect students from mental harm, from words, feelings, and images. Safe spaces, ladies and gentlemen, mirror the sexism that women have fought in the past. Universities and students' unions now deem women too vulnerable, too weak, and too scared to manage university life without bureaucratic structures to protect them from other students. So university campuses today are, um, are like living in a Jane Austen novel, except it's not the patriarchal society confining women to the safety of the drawing room, it's their own peers. So first I'm gonna talk about the dangers of moral policing and the changing dynamic that we have of what safety actually is. Students can't talk about the problem of illegal immigration without being called a xenophobe or being told that no human being is illegal. Now, I can't, I can't talk about how I feel the modern, modern feminism is manipulative and quite frankly useless without being called a misogynist. I can't, doctors can't openly talk about the dangers of obesity without, be, without being accused of fat shaming. And none of us can talk about the possibility of police brutality uh, possibly being over-sensationalized without being called racist, even though black on black crime is exponentially higher than police on black crime. And nobody talks about this. So for a culture of young people that's obsessed with, I'll take you in a moment, um, people obsessed with no labeling, they have an enormous amount of prejudice against people who disagree with them. So the idea of safety has been hijacked and mutilated in, in, the, uh, in the name of hypersensitivity. Safety has traditionally been the absence of physical, bodily, or um, coercive threat, and now feeling uncomfortable because someone has said a word or mentioned a topic you don't like or you disagree with is equivalent to being unsafe. And since we put safety first, the result is an increasingly police environment. The result of this is where these words and themes are discouraged and outright suppressed. We've come to be, we, uh, sorry, excuse me, we've become unwilling to disagree and debate because these are considered inherently unsafe to a generation of young adults who prioritize feelings over maturation. So safe spaces is a direct corollary of this rise of identity politics, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, it's fantastic. So <laughs> arguments on issues such as prostitution and transgenderism now are being branded as hate speech and um, identity of the person has become as important as the words that they're saying. Time and time again, we see universities cancel events, cancel speakers, cancel debates. The restriction of this type of free speech is directly in line with political and economic reasons Now, the universities are scared. They're scared on the grounds of litigation and when there's, a, on, on the basis of emotional harm. And where litigation isn't a concern, th there, there's fear of protest that might create a reputational risk for the university. So this institutional caution is kind of being reinforced by this commercial relationship that we've created for ourselves. We've created this relationship with universities that we feel that because we pay tuition fees, it means that we see ourselves as customers that are entitled to, uh, to feel the comfort of the service that we're purchasing on campus. So this sense of emotional entitlement is dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. It's dangerous to the environment that we create for ourselves. Yeah. Is it entitlement if I want my university not to give a platform and funding to someone whose views question my existence and invalidate my life experiences? 
Well, absolutely, but how can, we, how can we question our own existence and question our own views if our views are being suppressed and if they're not going to debate someone else's? I'm sure somebody on the other side of the table who disagrees with your opinion as well would also feel the same way that if you disagreed with them. So if we allow for open debate, it's, it's, this is exactly leads on to my next point, that we create for ourselves a dangerous, a, a dangerous space because it's, it, it's, it's dangerous to the democratic principles that underpin the nature of the education system to begin with. This leads on to my second point as well. The absolute need to develop an appreciation for diversity to avoid exclusion. Safe spaces by nature are exclusionary. Imagine a room that you're surrounded by walls, okay? So whenever you speak to the room, it echoes. So whenever you speak, the only voice that you hear is your own. This is called an echo chamber, and this is exactly what a safe space is. So, thank you. One interesting, so one interesting feature about this, ladies and gentlemen, is, I'll take it in a minute, is that evidently only a small group of like-minded individuals are entitled to feel safe. Anyone who disagrees with a very particular set of views is fair game for ridicule, verbal abuse, and sometimes even threats of physical violence. Yeah, I'll take you now. I understand what you're saying, absolutely, but the problem is if you shield these people, if you shield people with issues, and if you shield people, for, for example, if they face fat shaming off of campus, what's the point of giving them this dis disillusionment that they're going to be safe on campus and they're not going to be safe everywhere else? You're almost, you're, you're almost making them even more insecure that there's no safe spaces that exist outside of the university campus. Isn't that more harmful to them? Thank you. <laughs> So the safe space movement, ladies and gentlemen, is becoming a way to silence divergent voices and almost codify Tumblr rants into our legislation. I mean, like, who wants that, really? Safe spaces for one person is an unspace, unsafe space for another person. This creates a hierarchy of needs for people. We're not advocating, ladies and gentlemen, to expose the vulnerable members of our community. We're not advocating anything like that. It, we're, we're not we, but the thing is, we don't want to tiptoe around the <laughs> subjects, which, it, which isn't going to resolve anything by itself. To quote Charles Heston, political correct correctness is tyranny with manners. Classroom discussions are already neutral zones. And saying that, um, and saying that to, to discuss these cont cont contentious topics, but a discussion of violence is unlikely to be followed by an, actual, uh, by an actual violence. So it's a really good place to start. It's a good place to help students change the associations that are causing them discomfort in the first place. If you're not gonna be able to do it in, on campus or in the classroom without branding in a safe space, where are you going to be able to do it? So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna give you a couple of reasons why we should stop lying to ourselves. Reinforcing insecurities for members of our community, implying that everything outside of our um, space is not safe, as I just mentioned earlier, and in some way believe that this is in some ways, or that they, they can feel and do and be whoever they want to be just within the safe space is, and they can't be functional outside of it, it creates this loop of dependency it, it, that can't be shaken after they've left college because of this disillusion idea that I just spoke about a couple of seconds ago. But we bred this into them, ladies and gentlemen, we bred this into ourselves that everybody is going to be a silent and tolerant um, beyond the college walls, but they're not going to be. It's a false perception of the real world. They're self-enforcing they're, they're uh, self segregation spaces which operate like tyranny, ladies and gentlemen. So, so um, let's just say we're going to make college campuses safe, for instance, and let's just say this becomes institutionalized and schools start to adapt our policies. What's going to happen? Let me give you um, an example of my youth, that when I was going to school in the Middle East, we would not have any content whatsoever on communism. We won't have any content whatsoever on Judaism or Israel or the Holocaust. Like, it didn't happen. It created gaps in our knowledge. It created really dangerous gaps that we need to learn. And this type of censorship was done because, first of all, it could be offensive to Muslims to, uh, to recognize Israel as a state. <clears throat> and second of all, it could be offensive to Palestinians. Now, we stopped this and we didn't learn about these really important historical events because we didn't want to offend people. So where censorship inv is involved, it, it just, results in all of us becoming extremely ignorant. We can't ignore these, and it seeks to delegitimize any speech that it doesn't like and avoid discussion altogether. We explore and come to terms with things, and if we stop learning about them, we stop learning to do something about them. So this also raises the question of how exactly do you measure offense? If there's no way to gauge what offends people, trying to apply trigger warnings to every single conversation to find material in universities which is inclusive of all students, of all backgrounds, um, and all experiences to learn based on their choice to be offended would be a logistical nightmare, if not impossible, and it would decrease the overall quality of our learning experience. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody should be obliged to have Donald Trump in their dorm room or, or as a special guest in a Hispanic social night, or I wouldn't really want to see him hired as a professor of race relations in college, but what I would like to see is to see him invited to, to speak at a student debating society right over here, where I'm sure other speakers and student audience would subject him to a really well-deserved roasting. So ladies and gentlemen, this is not a debate about institutionalized injustice. 
as the opposition may have you believe. This is an addiction to indignation. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to use this speech as to explain to you as someone who's very much reliant on safe spaces myself, just why the proposition is wrong and why safe spaces are so important, and why they're sorely needed by the many, many of us who are regularly silenced or attacked because we don't belong to the powerful privilege to dominate our society. Be that because we are women, because we belong to the LGBT community, because we're not white, or because we struggle with mental health issues or because of any other reason. Because you see, there's one fatal assumption behind the idea that safe spaces are not really necessary because after all, the world isn't really unsafe. And that is the assumption that the experiences of the privileged are everyone's experiences. Because here's the thing, unless you belong to a marginalized group, you can never fully understand the reality of the painful life experiences we make every single day. Every single day, I go about my life hearing things like, did you hear that person X has been to a mental ward, told you he's crazy? Or, she just, she's just clearly doing that to get attention. Or, these people are just lazy. We don't need to spend more money on counseling. What we need is for people to toughen up. I hear these things knowing that I have a lifelong mental illness. I hear these things knowing that statistically, there's a 50% chance that I will attempt suicide and maybe die from it. And I hear these things knowing that the vast majority of people with my disorder will never get the treatment they need to survive because they don't live in a safe space free from the social judgment and the stigma that parent is preventing them from getting treatment. These opinions are pervading all of society and safe spaces are the only respite from that. They are spaces for individuals who are marginalized to come together to communicate regarding their experiences of marginalization, to finally be able to speak and act freely without fear of being judged and attacked all the time. And there are places for us to find collective strength. We need spaces away from the harmful, these harmful opinions because they are everywhere. They're literally invalidating our ex existence by constantly judging us and by questioning whether we are really discriminated against, whether we are really making life experiences of being hurt by society or whether we are just spoiled, cuddled children. Can I have a question? No, thanks. Safe spaces are necessary because non-engagement with these opinions is sometimes our only option. Because even though we'll hopefully change these mindsets one day, we're still far away from it. We're not anywhere, anywhere close to that. And it's not my duty as a member of a marginalized group to constantly educate everyone, to constantly negotiate whether the obstacles, obstacles I face are really that bad. Because that's the thing that people who mock safe spaces get wrong. Creating safe spaces is not about an echo chamber. It's not about closing our eyes and ears and hiding from scary ideas. Because these ideas are nothing new. Like, these ideas pervade society. They intoxicate us every day. We know them by heart. What safe spaces are about instead is one thing the institution we belong to, the university that is our home to advocate for us, to be on our side. We want them to not support harmful ideas that invalidate our existence and that unfortunately already have enough exposure in the world. When my university invites a speaker who questions whether mental illness is real and whether we should accommodate this, what they're doing is legitimizing the speaker's use as something that's up for discussion. They're giving a platform and financial support to someone whose controversial opinions don't accept my existence. What they're doing is they're like, sorry, sorry. Um, and they're contributing to the hostile climate that members of marginalized groups already feel every day and that we're trying our hardest to change. There's also another important thing to be made about safe spaces, and this is why it is about institutionalized power, unlike the proposition tells you. And that's that, uh, that uh, safe spaces are about power intrinsically, and specifically about reclaiming power from groups for groups who have always been silenced by society. Because the problem with many of pe those who support such controversial opinions under the banner of free speech is, whose free speech are they protecting? They're usually protecting the free speech of the privileged, 
of those who will always be more powerful and who will naturally dominate conversation in the public sphere anyway. We need open debate, it's like this argument of the proposition. But you know, safe spaces are what really enable you to have free, diverse, open debate because they're, they're the only thing that enable people who are marginalized every day to express themselves without constantly sacrificing our safety and our emotional well-being. Safe spaces have been described as like infantile, like soft comfort blankets for overgrown cuddle toddlers, when in fact they're anything but. They are bold actions by marginalized groups against structures of oppression. Because how come something so innocent and good, like safe spaces for oppressed groups, has been so viciously attacked and smeared in the media? Because safe spaces are intrinsically about power, and the privileged don't like being called out on their oppressive power, and even less to have some of it taken away. The point about the new liberation movements behind safe spaces is that they're the movements of the previously silent, who are beginning to take back spaces from a privileged majority. They show that we are finally not giving our passive okay to the marginalization of our existence by the privileged and the mainstream anymore. We are finally standing up and saying that the questioning of our existence and the experiences that we make is not an okay thing to do anymore. Here's the thing. You need to recognize that something is wrong with the world, that it is a harmful and hateful place towards many people who aren't white, straight, cis, healthy, middle-class men. You need to recognize that force in order to change something. If anything, this is not cuddling. This is, like, nothing about our life experiences is cuddling. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking away the cuddling illusion of the privileged cis white middle class men that the world is a good place for everyone. And like, why need safe spaces? Because they're good for me, the world's like, safe for me anyway. Um, no, thanks. Um, so this is why taking away the comfortable uh, illusion annoys and scares those with, those with privilege. Because they finally have to think about what they could be possibly doing wrong and how power relations might be unfair without them ever even noticing. So we need this recognition to change something. Because this debate comes at a time when things are slowly changing. When students are campaigning for university to spend more money on mental health services. When students are campaigning for university to take sexual assault on campus more seriously. But you know, it's easy because by mocking safe spaces, you make these issues sound ridiculous. Why change anything if there's no problem outside the, spo the minds of spoiled, overgrown kids anyway? But turning our, our universities into a safer space, we are finally changing something. We're finally fighting back against dehumanizing, destructive opinions that strip us of our very selves and that are propagated by the powerful under the banner of free speech. And a lot of these privileged people are scared as hell that we don't quietly listen and hide for their approval anymore. That is why safe spaces are so viciously mocked and resisted. A lot of the discourse around safe spaces is about how we, the students who demand them, need to grow up and face the real world. But here's the thing. They're scared as hell that we are growing up, but not like them, not like they'd like us to. Not preserving their comfortable old structures of power. There is all this talk about how universities need to prepare students for the real world and like stop shielding them. But again, this logic has a fatal flaw because it assumes that the real world is a given, something that we have to accept as it is, not something that we make and can change. But by creating safe spaces, we're already making changes in the world by forcing the mainstream to recognize our existence and to hear our voices. We're giving power to people who have historically never had it. And if that's not something good, then I don't know what is. gentlemen and firstly I would like to thank uh, the Phil for inviting me to speak to you this evening. Uh, I just want to remind you first of the motion uh, because I think we're moving slightly away from it. It's, this house believes that college should not be a safe space. It's not this house believes safe spaces are great, this house believes there should be no safe space anywhere. This house believes that college should not be a safe space and that's really important because what we're moving from is areas of safety for speech to college as an entire place where certain topics cannot be discussed. So firstly, I'd like to congratulate you all for coming to an unsafe space. I feel like we've, no, you can sit down. Um, I feel like we've already, in a sense, 
got you all on side, because if college was a safe space, we would not be able to have this debate. Because you do not know what I am going to say. You don't know what any of the speakers are going to say. And many of those things could end up being things that you find deeply offensive, hurtful, harmful, could even trigger you. And therefore, automatically, every single one of you here today is in an unsafe space. So welcome. I just want to pick up on what the last speaker said, and I think it's instructive that the speaker took no points uh, at any time from any of the opposition, which uh, shows you, I think, the attitudes towards free speech and debate that's uh, shown by the opposition to this motion. Um, but this very notion I would like to object to, that in some way uh, safe space is a delegitimization of the powerful, that free speech is about protecting those in power, Absolutely not, and we have to fight back at every opportunity at this notion that free speech really is only for the privileged and the powerful. The whole point of free speech and the reason free speech is so powerful is because it can protect both the weak and the powerful. Let's think of an example. So Trinity College for a long time didn't take women. Uh, it didn't take certain religious groups. So for those people, the very existence of a woman, for example, coming to speak to them would have violated their own safe space. Surely we're not arguing that students in Trinity College today get to decide which speakers are acceptable and which speakers aren't. No, you can sit down. Uh, because 30 years ago, the individuals who would have been considered unacceptable to the individuals there would have been us, the minorities, those who didn't have uh, the podium. So I absolutely welcome the opportunity to be able to have speakers of all uh, stripes who can challenge our thinking. To me, the notion that we shouldn't hear certain views with which we disagree, as the speaker uh, uh, alluded to earlier, is the very antithesis of education. I don't know what you all thought you were coming to university to do, but I hope that it was to learn something new, to be educated. The function of an education, as Martin Luther King said, is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. And that means encountering views, opinions and ideas, not only with which you disagree, but which you might find offensive, harmful, distasteful. It's absolutely vital for the progress of society that we are able to encounter those ideas and push through and make progress so that, in fact, we do have a society in which women's voices can be heard. Yes? Like it, it's just so easy, for example, for an African-American person in the US to access ideas which, are, which, which challenge them as a person. What is unique, what is special, is spaces which they don't have to confront that. That's the abnormal thing. Yeah, and I, and I don't disagree with you, but I'm not a university should not be a blanket location where you never encounter those ideas, where it's acceptable for student unions to disinvite people because they decide that they're offensive to one group of people. Absolutely. If you choose to protect yourself from hearing certain ideas, you can do that. But it's certainly not up to you to decide which groups and which individuals get to speak. Let's take a couple of examples. Last year, um, a feminist writer called Julie Bindle, who you may have heard of, who may indeed have spoken here, I don't know, um, was disinvited, or in fact banned from speaking at Manchester University um, on free speech, in fact, um, because it was considered that she violated their safe space policy, um, because she might incite hatred of transgender students. This is a woman who does not advocate violence, doesn't incite violence, but the idea that her ideas themselves might incite hatred towards transgender students means she was disinvited from that speech. Interestingly, Milo Yiannopoulos, who I notice you have on your posters, uh, unfortunately, uh, for this debate, um, was not disinvited initially, but then was afterwards. So which sides get to decide which voices can be heard and which can't? And, and since when do we decide that viewpoints are so contentious that they can't even be heard because they might somehow, in the mind of someone, create an environment in which there's... Yeah, go on. Disadvantaged, disadvantaged uh, individuals absolutely do get spaces in which they can voice them. And the way that we are going to counter powerful views 
is not through silencing the individuals who express their views, it's finding mechanisms to raise up those voices. So let's think more intelligently, for example. I'm absolutely delighted that you didn't invite Milo Yiannopoulos to stand here and give my speech, because frankly, I do agree that the notion that uh, uh, free speech is only for right-wing white males is not helped by the fact that the most pe people who are invited most to speak about it are right-wing white males. So let's be, let's be thoughtful. If you're going to invite speakers to give keynote speeches, perhaps don't always invite the most powerful and obvious people. Perhaps invite, for example, a transgender activist. But we're not going to achieve the, the uh, outcome that we want, which is to give more voice and more power to marginalised people by silencing the opposition and the other side. We get it by making sure that those people have platforms on which to speak. Protect, the idea that protecting objectionable views protects you is nonsensical. And in fact, the very thing that allows those people to say the things to, what, to which you object is what allows you to voice your opinions. So who gets to decide which opinions are good um, and which aren't? And I think, to me, that's one of the absolutely central tenets of this argument is it's always assumed that the weak side, for example, perhaps, the less powerful, is the good side, the right side. But as I've hopefully articulated, it depends which side, on, wh on which side you stand, for example. So if we don't want to hear uh, anti-Islamic views, for example, uh, perhaps those people shouldn't be allowed to speak in universities. Well, let me give you an example of Goldsmith University earlier this year. An ex-Muslim and feminist activist called Marion Ramazi was at Goldsmiths University to give a talk. She was trying to speak and a group from the Islamic Society sat in the front of her lecture and shouted, safe space, safe space at her. So, and perhaps legitimately in the view of the opposition, should those people who considered her to be violating their safe space be allowed to shut Marion Ramazi down? Absolutely not. You have to be able to hear the other side and shutting down the other side rather than promoting those who don't necessarily always have the podium is not the way to go about it. If we want college to be a safe space, the whole of Trinity College Dublin, you will end up in a situation where you'll open your books and there will be nothing written there. You will go to your lectures and there will be nothing said. If you want a good example of this, you just need to look at Oberlin College, for example, which uh, decided that it was going to have trigger warnings. And the trigger warnings were, um, they advised their professors not to talk about colonialism, not to talk about racism, and not to talk about sexism. Unsurprisingly, Oberlin rescinded that order quite quickly because it was discovered that you couldn't talk about most things. It was very difficult to discuss most history if you avoided talking about those subjects. As our first speaker articulated, I would argue very powerfully that making college a safe space doesn't make us safer. In fact, it's more dangerous because it means we don't encounter opposing and different views. And it's only by encountering them, opposing them, that we can tackle them and move forward. It's only by having those things out in the open that we can genuinely make progress. And as I said in my opening remarks, I'm delighted that you support the motion by having joined us here in this deeply wonderful unsafe space. Thank you. I was watching a YouTube video of a Phil debate about writing versus academia yeah. only last week. <laughs> and it was nice to see my fellow mates talking, discussing their sex life in such a comfortable way. 
And this is what it led me to be here to be for my first debate. And I would like to thank Phil Society for providing a space where you are comfortable to express your mind free, regardless of sex, race, sexual orientation, or physical or mental ability. I know Jody said that it's not a it's an unsafe space, but then she contradicted herself saying it's a safe space. So I don't know. But this shows that from the last 500 years, it's a proof that there are ways of debating issues with, uh, which are not hurtful. Now imagine if there was no safe space like this. And what exactly we expect from college? College must protect our right to feel safe. If we are positioned to enter a space that may or may not be safe to learn or interact and share, puts us in a situation where we either choose to stay or enter, uh, endure the situation. I'll give you an example. It's about a GSN study about the LGBT students. Feeling they either skip class or do not go even out of school for a few days because of fear of their personal safety. Do we want this in our lecture halls as well? It is unsafe because someone's views which we find offensive or upsetting. The belief that we have to listen to everyone's view. It is not a question. It is not for someone else to say. It is our decision. Yes? Are you obliged to go to every single event at your university? Sorry? Are you obliged to go to every single event at your university? No. Uh, Jody just said that you have to listen to every other uh, uh, view. You should not stop anybody. That's what I'm talking about. You're not obliged, so you choose not to. And. Let me ask more, one more thing. Exactly whose speech are we trying to protect from providing a platform? Far-right radicals, racists, homophobes, and controversial speaker. I will say again Michaela's point, which I feel is really important. Every time we invite these people, we are legitimizing their views as something that is up for discussion. The issues discussed affect real people. These speakers are here, want to change our views. Instead of fostering academia freedom, we could be fostering mistrust and negativity. Having one's view broadcast on a platform or being heard is not some kind of right. It is about asking a certain question about what, who has the right to speak. Should we invite German Greer, who thinks that trans women are not real women? In Ireland, we overwhelmingly voted uh, in favor of marriage equality and for freedom to, for someone to be who they are. And I ask you, is it worth for our college to be associated with uh, such controversies, have a reputation of no moral consensus? Controversies may be good publicity, but it is not cheap. What effect will increasing college fees, tuition fees will have on us? In 1859, John Stuart Mill argued fullest liberty of expression, but only introduced the, also introduced the harm principle. He stated, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully expressed over any member of, a, of the society is to protect, uh, prevent them from harm to others. Also, the Article 12 of 1997 Universities Act states, one of the objects of the university is to promote gender balance and equality of opportunities among students and employees of the university. A lack of safe space can compound the mental toll from racism even in a subtle form. Racial and gender identity deserve special considerations because they are aspects of one biological and historical self. We all deserve a safe space to be able to create our own identities, free from the presence of the people who are not like us. It is easier to discuss without the oppressor present and connect with our lecturers and peers. Being able to know beforehand what experiences we should avoid and create an environment where we feel safe makes it easier to share our struggles and move past them. Let me ask you a simple question. Should we have no rating system for movies and let anybody see the movies? You will always decide if you, what sort of movie you like, what rating it is. And the strength of hotness written on food menus. Next time we go to an Indian restaurant, should we order our food without looking at the um, number of chilies and see how <laughs> comfortable you feel? These spaces Quinn, take, Quinn, yes? How would you rate this debate, for example, if you can't possibly know in advance
advance every single discussion and the content of it and what elements of it might offend or harm or hurt an individual. But uh, you're talking about trigger warnings. You said, no, no you, sh you said the trigger warning should not be there. I'm talking about the need for trigger warnings. Remember you said like the trigger warnings uh, yeah. earlier in your speech? Yeah, but that's not <laughs> my <word. laughs> No, what you're talking about then? I'm talking about trigger warnings, basically. Yeah, but for everything. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, the, these spaces take students' needs and want into accounts. Slut walk and take back the right are helping in ending stigma for sexual assaults. Now, somebody who's very, uh, spoke about freedom of speech, Stephen Fry, in Dave Rubin's interview, said child sexual abuse wisdom, uh, victims to stop sorry for themselves and grow up. Is this how we treat the vulnerable pe uh, members of our society? A phase of healing involves reclaiming power and control in positive ways. Rule guards everyone's feelings and encourage everyone to respect each other. Mona Amur of Anti-Bully Center at Trinity College has written that individuals, whether child or adult, who are consistently subjected to abusive behavior are at risk of stress-related illness, which can sometimes lead to suicide. Our forefathers fought for us to live freely in the, by creating safe space. Let us not forget their sacrifices and create an uncomfortable space for our future generations. Our college should be vanguard by modeling the way forward and not backward. My friends in favor of no space advocate that once a space is safe, others are deemed to be unsafe. I will argue once the space is safe, we can look at other places which can be improved to have a better society. Safe space acts as a mean rather than an end and is not a physical space, but a space coming together as a community. Thank you. speech I'm about to make, but I would like you to open your mind to the possibility that safe space in college is a preposterous idea. And me stating this fact is it's itself violating a safe space, because I believe something that my opponents do not believe, so I'm not in my safe space. First of all, I would like to say why safe spaces are so detrimental to many aspects of society. Education, sexuality, development of a personal personality. It's, it is so detrimental to that development that they are just ridiculous in my opinion. But then again, that is my opinion, which goes against someone else's, so I'm violating the safe space. <laughs> I would like to say that my first experience of my safe space in college was when I moved into my flat. Now, there was, uh, I moved into my flat and the fifth room was empty for the first uh, two days and we didn't know who was going in there. And then someone came in, an English person, and straight away, I was worried. I was like, is he going to come into my room, take all of my stuff, and not leave for 700 years? This was <laughs> violent. <laughs> Naturally, this was violating my safe space. But after three weeks of getting to know the man, he doesn't take my stuff, he only takes my cans. And he's actually, unfortunately he's sitting down there so I can't say how good friends we are. I despise you, Harry, sorry. <laughs> no, but by opening my mind and going out of my comfort zone or safe space, I've made a friend, please God, for life. <laughs> But that is not the only place where safe spaces, in my opinion, are ridiculous. Education, I hope, the reason we're all here, besides to go out and get drunk, obviously. Education is so... <laughs> education <laughs> is so a place where safe spaces are not... do not contribute to the inf information and to the, the learning of the people here. Because the development of ideas... Ideas are development, uh, developed by two people arguing and then eventually coming to a consensus. So in my lecture today, which I think I was awake for, I went in and there was about 1798 rebellion and I'm from the Wexford part of the country, so I was nat naturally on the nationalist side, but then someone argued a very unionist point of view. And by this, we came to a natural consensus that yes, there was merit to both sides. But if I had gone in and said, no, I'm in my safe space, I'm not listening to you, you're silly. 
I would not have learned anything in that tutorial. But by going out of my safe place, my comfort zone, I learned so much and I realised that there are far more than one ways to look at a certain issue. Also, with education, pettiness solves nothing. I could, my opponents have raised many good points. Instead of just sitting there and saying, no, in my safe space, I don't care. That is not going to help anyone. By listening to their views and taking them into account and going outside of my safe space, I am learning, please. Okay, but what As again, my colleague pointed out, maybe there should be safe spaces in society, but college is not that place, because college is about the bringing together of ideas and forming of your personality. Like you said about the coming of migrants, and they've heard that thing so many times before, but if you have an opinion strong, if you have a strong opinion and you believe that you are right, you should be able to argue that opinion until you have no breath left in your body. You should be able to say to that person, this is what I believe, and this is why you should listen to me. And if you can't do that, Maybe you should listen to the other person and maybe your opinion should change. But without safe spaces, that does not exist. Please. If you're a member of a marginalised group, you have to listen to these opinions every day and you fight against them every day. But there are times when you're too tired to fight because you're doing it every day and there's nothing new and no one listens to you because the privileged are shouting because they have that much more power. Why should we have space? An absolutely excellent point. And your point about mental health was so spot on because I can get another anecdote. A friend um, at home in my town, there was a woman, and she, it was a safe space because no one discussed the issue. If the issue is not discussed, it is a safe space. She went through these trials and tribulations every day of her life, and at the end of it, two of my friends no longer have their mother because her safe space forbid her from talking about her issues. If it had not been a safe space, if she had been able to stand up and say, no, that is not true, people of mental health are not less than you think they are, this is not a safe space, then she might still be here today. But because of the safe space, she submitted to the idea that people with mental mental health issues are less, which is totally preposterous. But by saying it is not a safe space, she would have been standing up. But unfortunately, my friends no longer have their mother. And by the creation of that safe space, I believe that has been detrimental to the whole town. I think, again, an excellent, an excellent point. But do you really think the people from around the country are not coming to college because they're going to call me a bit fat? That is not true. Saying that because it is not a safe space, do you think you're going to go to college? College is regarded widely as a very liberal, open-minded place because it is not a safe space where one view is tolerated. It is a place where views are discussed, where people from all over the country, and indeed all over the world, as Harry has proved, that they come together and share their ideas and views. Because of this, they come and they are able to find their voice. If someone in the apartment across from me doesn't agree with my view, I can argue my view until, again, I have a sore throat. But that is because it is not a safe space, because it is a place where I can voice my opinion even if it differs with the status quo. Please. Again, an excellent point, but do you believe that going into a safe place and people just saying, yes, your idea is totally right, your views are totally correct, you are 100% correct, do you think that will enable that person to find their voice? By diversity, that person will find the strength, I believe, to find their voice and to argue their point. Because if you are told by everyone in this room, you're brilliant, you're just going to think you're brilliant and you're not going to argue the case. Whereas if people challenge you, you are going to stand up and use your voice to argue why indeed you are brilliant. I am not, sorry. But if someone is and they believe that, they will use every bone in their body to argue that their point is right. So I agree, safe spaces, again, in other places, may be needed for people to find the strength. But university is the place where you use that. Whatever strength you have, may it be a thimble or 16 pints of strength, Strength. You use it and you argue your case until you can argue it no more. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening.
Do you have that feeling when you're about to have a nosebleed? I feel like I have that right now. So if my nose starts bleeding, just ignore it. We'll keep going. Okay. No. Right. Between the ages of five and seven, I used to sleep with my bedroom door open. Um, not because I was scared of the dark. Side note, I was scared of aliens. Um, I was one of those kids. If you know me, that shouldn't surprise you all that much. Um, but because the reason I kept the door open is because every night before my siblings and I went to bed, our parents used to take turns sitting in the hallway and reading us Harry Potter. Two things on this. First of all, props to my parents for their super efficient bed, uh, parenting strategy of simultaneously reading four bedtime stories at once. Um, but the second thing, and the thing that sticks with me most, is how much I hated my dad reading me bedtime stories. Now, in fairness to Dermot, side note, I call my parents by their first names. Yes, I'm one of those kids. It shouldn't surprise you all that much. Um, he was a pretty good storyteller. He was great at accents, great at cliffhangers, all that kind of thing. Now, the issue I took with Dermot I don't, I don't know why I've written this anyway. The issue I took with Dermot was that every single time he read us Harry Potter, he used to insist that every single character was consistently farting over and over and over again. Strangest anecdote of my life. Oh, well, we're just going to go with it. So allow me to elaborate. Here's a passage from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone from the book. So Hermione stepped forward. Neville, she said, I'm really, really sorry about this. She raised her wand. Petrificus totalis, she cried, pointing it at Neville. Neville's arm snapped to his sides. Here's how my dad would read it. Hermione stepped forward. Neville, she farted. I'm really, really sorry about this, she raised her wand. Petrificus totalis, she farted, pointing at Neville, farting wildly as she did so. Neville's arm snapped to his side. I hated this. I was a Harry Potter fan from age five, and I knew Hermione was not farting. This was inserted by my dad for laughs, and I was getting really, really angry. Dermot, I'd say, Hermione doesn't fart there. Stop making things up. And he'd say, of course she farted. Why else would he say that she was farting? I wouldn't just make that sort of thing up. Tom, now go to bed before I get the newspaper. Side note, a rolled up newspaper was my family's equivalent of the wooden spoon. Um, He'd pull this trick on me constantly. And I was never able to fight back because he was the one with the story, he was the one in charge. And it taught me a very important lesson, one that is entirely relevant to this debate, because I'm sure at this stage some of you are like, where is he going with this? <laughs> the point that I wanted to raise was the, um, how narratives shape how we frame uh, different debates and how we approach different contexts. And I'm going to explore two narratives in this speech around the concept of space, safe spaces in universities. And I'm going to confine it just to universities so I appease the proposition side. And um, the first way I'm going to talk about this narrative is how um, people are saying that we're all snivelling professional victims, unlike the super activist generation before us. And the second narrative I'm going to talk about is how university is supposed to somehow challenge our delicate sensibilities. Okay, so first of all, there's a false distinction between the students of today and the students of yesteryear, students of back in the day, or to quote Rachel Green from Friends, the age of yore. Um, students of today, we are told, are weak. They are soft-shelled, dainty little special snowflakes who live bubble-wrapped lives and are so easily bruised that to compare them with a peach would be an insult to both peaches and fruit kind in general. Students of yesterday, by contrast, were very different. They were all spikes and hard edges and leather jackets and sneering at authority figures and rock and roll and angst and smoking rollies and protesting. And boy, did they like protesting. Yes, please. I was none of those things. Oh. <laughs> well, this is the narrative that is being espoused by popular media, so I'm just going with what I'm getting from media. Um, boy, did they love protesting. Listen to Ed, most safe space naysayers, and they'll constantly feed you the line that students back in the day didn't just sit around being triggered. They went out and they changed things, and they marched, and they did sit and they probably smoked even more rollies. They perpetuated the narrative that the students of today are too scared to affect change and the students of yesterday were badass social justice warriors. The problem with this narrative is that it fails to take into account one major point, that safe spaces are an inherent part of all activism. In the 60s, marginalised groups that are now upheld as models of student debate, like LGBT activists, feminists, civil rights movements over in the States, used safe spaces on the basis on which they built their activism. For every bus, bus boycott and protest flyer printed, there was a moment when a group of individuals came together and found a space in which they felt listened to and valued equally. In painting safe spaces as the weakness of the new generation, one ignores an integral part of any movement, the time before the protest, the therapeutic revelation of common experience and the validation that comes from your struggle being recognised as gendered or racist or political, but most of all, important. First of all, characterised um, a lot of modern day debates as being um, not about political things, but about emotional things and protecting delicate sensibilities. This is a false distinction because um, 
emotions are political. Power uh, and, and power, uh, political things are about the distribution of power. So if you feel aggrieved by something, it's more likely than not because the system denies you power that other people have. And therefore, if you feel bad about something, it's because you want to affect a change. So I don't accept the argument that we're all just feeling bad about ourselves. It's because the world is an inherently unsafe space for some people and we need to fight to change that. University should be a space, safe space particularly because the world is not a safe space for so many people. We are at a critical time in our lives. I've already taken one point. I have too much to talk about, sorry. Um, um, we are at a time in our lives when our preferences or beliefs are shaped. So to not create a safe space where we can all contribute um, equally is to waste the potential that a university has to be a force for good in the wider world. The second narrative espoused by those who reject safe spaces is that university is not the place to feel safe. And it came up in like second and third speakers just there. It's a place to be challenged. It's a place to stretch your mind, to confront things you disagree with, and to become a critically aware individual. I completely agree with all of this. Universities are a place to be challenged and stretched. Where I disagree with this narrative, though, is when it goes on to explaining how this challenge should come about. They see it as the responsibility of the university to promote uncomfortable learning, to show a variety of viewpoints, and tough luck to anyone that finds this content offensive or triggering. Most educators will tell you in this area that it's only when one feels comfortable that one can grapple with uncomfortable learning to internalise it and formulate their own viewpoints. In a university setting that champions uncomfortable learning, the same few groups will be the ones most harmed by the practices of this university. Why? Because universities were founded by rich white men in the most part to extol the scholarly glories of rich white men with the intention of producing a new generation of graduates who conflate being rich and white and male with being right, thereby creating systemic oppression within universities for groups within campuses that don't fit in within those norms. Granted, things are changing so much with an iPad here and an e-book there, but given that how we educate ourselves hasn't substantially changed in the last 500 years or so, and you can see why it's hard to erase these, uh, erase these systemic biases entirely. Classrooms are not neutral spaces. Nothing is a neutral space, but we can try our hardest to create a safe space so that more people can contribute to the discussion. It's not fair to say that they're not safe spaces when they're built on such a systemic oppression of minorities. For universities, to best cater to the needs of all, it needs to create a safe space in which people can learn. But by, in, but by institutionalising challenge, uh, but if institutions, um, if the challenge from institutions emanates from them rather than the students themselves, we are institutionalising the systemic exclusion of minorities and disenfranchised groups. Safe spaces work as a counter to this as they allow for more viewpoints than just those of the institution in which they operate. We need safe spaces in order to allow for an education that caters to all and not just the fruit few. Let's change universities so that they take over their education, so that students take over their own education rather than universities presenting what they should be learning, they can approach what they want to learn. Narratives are powerful things, but by the end they're just stories, and if my dad can make up stories about Hermione Granger farting, we can certainly make a better story for education and support Trinity as a safe space for all. I urge you all to oppose this motion. <laughs> Given Sheila's not doing minutes this week, I'm going to be the one doing audience participation. <laughs> Hands up everyone in this room who supports repealing the Eighth Amendment. Pretty substantial crowd. Okay. Now, if I told you that I was a practicing Catholic or Muslim or some other religious group, and that the idea of, like, of repealing the Eighth was something that was offensive, that I was in a university where my union actively campaigned on that man mandate, where my, I'm frequently called a monster for the view I hold, for the view that is not just a view, but it's part of my identity, where I'm frequently at events where I feel that I like, cannot speak out. And the reason I know this is probably true to some level on this campus is that it's acceptable to wear a repeal jumper, but most Trinity students will vote Fine Gael in elections, and that's just statistically true. This is something that we exist. But yet, if I asked you again now with that new information, who had changed their mind? Who would no longer want to repeal the 8th? I doubt many people would raise their hands and change their mind. Because you know what? Some issues are too important. Sometimes things like repealing the 8th, like um, same-sex marriage, like many other things that come before it, are too important. Sometimes we have to, in some ways, offend people. Sometimes people are not go like their views are going to be challenged. That is how we get progress in today's world. This side of the house wants to focus on the easy part for them. They want to focus on views that are literally just inviting the Milos, inviting the really offensive people. This debate is more than just that. It is a lot more than just that. So a couple of things of categorisation. 
This is not a debate about safe spaces existing on campus, in that societies can run safe spaces, like there can be safe spaces for specific like, groups of individuals on campus. It's about campus-wide being a safe space, important thing to know. It is not about trigger warnings. Like trigger warnings, were pro like we can probably stand by those. It is, however, by the way, sorry if I've knifed to this side a little bit. Um, <laughs> It's about when we have material that could potentially, maybe, possibly, or maybe not, trigger one or two or a couple of people that we say, oh, we can't ever, ever discuss that. We can't ever discuss any sort of racial history. We can't ever discuss Tom Sawyer because it might offend someone. There are two parts to this debate. There is the ones where we sit, talk about things that are debatable. There's the ones where we talk about issues that aren't debatable. We say as well that universities are specifically a place to do this, the reason being that they are a centre of learning. You can have that safe space within a university and still learn and still develop. I'm going to show why those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Okay, so note things, safe spaces have been used currently across universities to justify things, like, to justify the opposition of things. It is, like, quite frankly, uh, like we say when we tell someone that like you cannot have this event because I differ a view from you. We say to someone that my two years of sociology gives me the arrogance to say that I know better, that there is not a, definitely not an opposition view to hold, that maybe you know, doing yoga is not awful cu cultural appropriation, that maybe we like, could have a discussion about different groups. We, saw debate, we see debates on whether Black Lives Matter is a good force against racism being shut down because it's racist. Not a it's not a question of racism, it's a question of one particular method, but we can't possibly discuss that. We hear, about exam we hear people literally being told to kill themselves because they write an op-ed that doesn't in keep with the liberal like, ideas on campus. We say that like, that is something that's problematic. We say that we do not get the progress. We say that the idea of marriage equality, the idea that I can you know, be able to marry the person I love is like, offensive to people. It was like ideas have always been offensive to people. The idea of admitting women to this college and to this society would have been offensive to people at the time. It would have violated the idea that they had of what a university should be. Sometimes we just don't care though. Sometimes we need to have an issue even when it's debate and contentious. Moving on, let's just talk about the impacts of this. Okay, this is moving on now into the idea of like speech that isn't debatable, speech that isn't whether X is a particular force of good or not for combating racism, but things like this side of the house talk about, like when we have people who say that trans women don't exist, which is just objectively not true, and we don't stand by defending them on our side of the house, okay? Like, I don't vape, I don't wear a fedora. Uh, the problem is, the problem is, that bans on extremist speech, that bans on trying to restrict, say, groups like, um, like groups like extremists, groups like far-right groups, just don't work. This is speech is going to exist anyway. It exists on both sides of this house. It will continue to exist. It will continue to have people in universities who hold these views. The reason we stand by our side is that it's comparatively better for us. It means that when you have these views, you get a couple of things. You get people who are willing to stand up and say, I'm going to question this. It means I'm going to like, stand up and be able to talk about it. Be able to talk and be able to say, I don't agree with your view. It means that people, uh, no thanks, um, it means as well that, um, that when you tell people that they're an asshole because they, make a mis like because they have a view that's disagree with you, that you find offensive, that you shut that discussion out. If I was to tell you I spent my summer in Bible camp, who here would like, you, you probably would assume I'm also like, you know, someone who hates anyone who's a different religion to me. We make assumptions about people and we create these two caricatures that never interact. These uh, caricatures, like, and it means that then it pe people become more extremists. We get two echo chambers because we don't engage. It means that the people we call an asshole because God forbid they didn't know everything about gender because the Irish sex ed program is like, they missed that class. It's so encompassing of gender as a general rule. It means that those people are shut down. It means they go into echo chambers where they continue to voice these views, where their views never get challenged, they become more and more extreme in their views, they feel the other side are just people they cannot engage with because they are nasty, it, therefore we get a harm in that. Furthermore, talking just about like what is literally, like how this manifests on college itself, because there's a mischaracterization on their side of the house. They tell us that when like an event happens, it's going to be directly like harmful to every single person on campus. Okay, look around colleges, there are lots of rooms, there are lots of buildings, there are lots of places, there are lots of students. Sure. Yes, and, and like sometimes your college is going to endorse views you disagree with because there are lots of students who have different points of view, and it's not illegitimate to say that your view counts as more important than someone else's. Okay? But, yeah. No thanks. Okay. But when it comes to the fact, okay, when it comes to legitimacy, for, like as well, just I'm not sure why your university is saying like Patrick Pentecost giving the thumbs up is going to like matter that much to people. We're not sure people that particularly care that much. But when we run events. You don't have to go. A poster is just a bit of colour on the wall. Most people don't like tend to ignore them. Sorry, <laughs> man. <laughs> like, 
some people will go and call them out, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. And you can have this idea of safe space without having to go to every single event. But it means as well that like we, when you have create protests about them, there's always going to be backlash, and that's where things get worse. The song Blurred Lines was not a song anyone anal analyzed the lyrics to until people started complaining about it. Then it becomes synonymous with it. Then when the like, massive storm of student media builds up about an event, that is when it becomes more and more upsetting to those people who don't want to go to that event, who can't go to that event because it's upsetting. Furthermore, like we say that that is something that is particularly harmful because it means that kind of storm we create on campus, which is always going to happen with this free speech debate that seems to be a constant rolling thing on campus and seems to have a yearly installation in the term card of every single debating society, is going to continue. I am so proud to propose this motion. I am so proud to propose this motion in a space I know I can feel safe to propose it. Thank you. scattered pages and scattered thoughts of my mind. <laughs> I would strap yourselves in. Okay, so basically, um, the way I see this debate, it's about a moment, and it's about a moment in which this kind of free speech movement is happening, and it's what we want to do with that moment, how we want to respond about it, to it, how we want to think about it. I think there's this interpretation of the safe spaces movement uh, that sees it kind of as a rising out of coddling people, as a rising out of treating people as vulnerable, as a rising out of this kind of addiction to indignation, which is, I think, a, a, a phrase I really disliked because it's indignation is horrible, and why would you ever want to be addicted to it? So, like, and I think, that, to be honest, like that's to me ex like so ridiculous. And like, when you consider actually like how this movement came about, this movement came about because like there were groups that like wanted safe spaces. Like, it's as simple as that. And there were groups that like. And like, the, uh, the reason why the idea of coddling is so ridiculous is that these groups are specifically people who have never been coddled. People like people who like African Americans who are targets of racist abuse, like people who are targets of sexual abuse, people who are targets of homophobic or Islamophobic abuse. Those are specifically people for whom life is hard. Those are specifically people who have never had the privilege of being coddled. Like we think that that therefore like. Like, for those people, it's good that we can create a space in which they can be coddled. Like, it was, uh, create a space in which it is safe. Um, like, there were groups in college that felt unsafe, um, and now those groups have become enfranchised enough to demand safety. Like, that is what this debate is about. Um, like, the only way that, like, movements like this happen is because people are angry and because people want change. And I think that sometimes that simple analysis is overlooked. So, like... I think it's disrespectful to suggest that this movement is fueled by some sort of selfishness, by some sort of misguided attempt at being like cushioned for your entire life, by some sort of like addiction to indignation. I think that that's insulting to the people who need these safe spaces, who want these safe spaces, um, and I think that those people are often overlooked. Like when we talk about safe spaces, like what are those people actually asking for? Like first thing, a big thing is like trigger warnings. Like it baffles me how on earth anyone has a problem with this. Like why is it? like an issue to you that you have to read before an article that that article is going to be about sexual abuse that that article might have explicit like explicit accident like there are lectures I would not have gone to if I had known what was going to be the content of that lecture and I would have not written my essay on that thing because I didn't know I was confronted with like horrific imagery of like necrophilia and that that, that lectures were using to be sensationalist like we think that that is a, th a, a choice I should have had like the second thing is guests and people kind of protesting guests and not wanting Wanting, um, like certain guests to come. Like I think why this is so controversial is that it challenges the very like core of the concept of prestige. It challenges what worthiness is. It challenges like like who we actually want to see. Like for a long, long time, like women have felt uncomfortable with the fact with that clearly misogynist writers, clearly misogynist philosophers were given this platform, and no one seemed to care that they are misogynist. Like that is a long, long feeling that is only now finding a space to protest itself. Like I just do not see how this is not a win-win situation. Like, 
Who cares? No, sorry, I'll take you later. Who cares that Julie Bindle did not speak in that college? Who cares that Mariam Namazi did not speak in that college? These people have like loads of books. They have loads of sites. You are. You can go check out their opinion, like if you want to. If not having them speak in that college made. 50 trans people feel better, a safer space, and then the other people could just read their book. Like, to me, that is just a win-win situation. And um, the third thing is kind of like, okay, to think that, okay, I think the third thing then is kind of specific groups that belong to uh, people. So like specifically, or like all African-American groups, all female groups, all LGBT groups, etc. cetera. Um, like, again, you were just not invited to that club, get over it, yeah, there's lots of other clubs for you. Okay, so. <laughs> So I think, yeah, I think it's about this moment that we're in. We have to realize that there's an energy and there's an appetite for this. Like, how, how do we want to interpret that? Like, either we view it as this, like, scary fad, and, like, the language that's used in the right, like, wing media about this is that it's terrifying. It's that this, like, rising specter over US colleges. Like, people trying to be more respectful. Like, it's just ridiculous. Like, we can make college spaces, or we can view it as, like, an attempt to make college spaces better, happier, more comfortable places for people to be in. Like instead of condemning students for being idealistic that the world can be a nicer, better place, we can celebrate the fact that that idealism exists, that they believe that that can, that that can actually happen. I think I lost the page. <laughs> yeah, Mark, go ahead. There are lots of people who are advocates of the student VA, who have books, who have other social media. Your analysis means those people can no longer be uh, like, available on campus. Sometimes ideas are too important. Sometimes it's not an idea that offends those people for their existence. Sometimes it's just an idea of their existence. Uh, yeah, okay, but like sometimes it's an idea that like someone is transphobic and like we don't need to hear their opinions. Like I don't think there's perfect solutions to this, but I think that saying that everyone should have their chance to speak is is is, is equally ridiculous. Um, uh, no, thank you. Um, okay, so. I then have this point that is titled on my page, uh, Goddamn Real Life Man. Um, so I think there's this idea that as well that one of the negative aspects about like non-safe spaces on college or safe spaces on college is that like it doesn't prepare you for the world. Like preparing you for the world is not necessarily assaulting you with all of these arguments and then you have to like decide which one, you know, you have to be exposed to everything even if you find it incredibly uncomfortable. Like college is not necessarily about mirroring the world like to prepare you for the world. Like it's the space spaces that give you the strength to face the non-safe spaces. Like Michaela talked about this idea of collective strength, of having like spaces where you can find the strength to face the outside world that like th that, that denies you that strength like being in the room where there's no men to tear you down or being in the room where those men have have an equal voice to you is what gives you like a vision of what that world could be like you need safe spaces no thank you like you need safe spaces so that you can like face the men who want to tear you down because you've had a vision of a world in which those men don't exist. Like honestly, uh, like even myself who lived an extremely privileged existence, I was like pretty hardened by the time that I was 16, just by like the things that teenage boys would tell to me about my looks, about my hairy legs, whatever. Like, and, I, and for that reason, like I didn't give my opinions on things, I didn't give my thoughts on things, just because I was so scared of being insulted, just because I was so scared of being like teared down. Like when the entire world, when outside of the, the rest of the world, I have to be an ice queen. Like just give me four years to be a special snowflake. Like, what is wrong with that? Like, how is that, is that harming you? And um, like, like uh, Jody talked earlier about how like college should be about learning new things. Like, here's what I learned when I came to college. I started like doing competitive de debating, and I learned that when I had my seven minutes, like I was just as good as other people. Like that actually I had been silenced. Actually, that I hadn't been given those seven minutes. Like that is not shutting people. Like, like safe spaces are not shutting people down. They're not silencing other people's opinions. They're just giving everyone their fucking seven minutes. Like, and at 10 minutes right now, it was like too much. And um, no, thank you. The reason why it feels like you're being silenced is that like, some people are used to speaking for 20 minutes. Like, that's why, that's the problem. And that's what some people would call an analogy. Okay, so, <laughs> so there's then this other question that I think we've been kind of barraged with, which is like, why colleges specifically? Like, first of all, I'd like to say, like, if they're saying that, um, like, safe spaces are kind of actually generally kind of good and should exist within colleges and certain rooms and should probably exist within society, but like, maybe not the entire college. Like, I think that they've kind of conceded a lot of the kind of meaty arguments of this debate anyway so but yeah but but just to engage with that like why colleges so I guess we have this idea that like colleges should be this kind of free flow of ideas that people should be challenging their preconceived notions like of how the world works their preconceived notions of what the world should or can be we think that that it's about conversation and it's about idealism and it's about change like 
there's that this is bizarre idea that like the safe spaces movement is a departure from that like the safe spaces movement is that it's it, it, it's analyzing that the way in which we think about free speech right now is not working it's actually stopping people from feeling safe it's actually stopping people from speaking and like the backlash that the safe space movement currently is getting is the exact same backlash that like the early feminists got like that they're overly sensitive that they don't understand how the world functions like they had a vision to change the world like so do we like like find like safe spaces at its very core is like about finding ways to respect people. It's about finding new ways to make people safe. And by the way, it's extremely early movement. It's only about two years old. Like the procedures by which we achieve those safe spaces, they might change. Actually, I think we should probably stop calling them safe spaces. Everyone seems really confused by that. Everyone's like, oh, but like in here, you're counting other opinions. Like, oh, whoa, like my mind is blown. I'm not in a safe space. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> like maybe we should call them safer spaces. Maybe we should call them more equal spaces in the exact same way that people like had a problem with trigger warnings they were like how can I know if something's triggering then we called them content notes you list the basic themes of the article like things like that are not actually that difficult to circumvent it's about the goal like the goal is good the goal is making a space that's more respectful a space in which people are more comfortable and that's what this is about so like <laughs> Yeah, so it's about, like, safe space idea, space, the safe spaces movement is a radical movement. And, like, that's what, like, I loved about competitive debating. Like, the, that, 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 that those aspects of being spoken over, being spoken for more than, like, uh, like that I no longer had to be spoken over because I was allowed to speak for my sp seven minutes and you have your seven minutes. Like, that was revolutionary. All that is is equality. All that is, is is giving everyone a space in which actually I can wave you down. Like, that was just so new and so amazing to me. And I think that, like, the Safe Spaces movement, what it is an essential, I and mean, when you boil it down and when you take it away from the kind of, like, language the right-wing media use and the language of kind of coddling and all this, like, silliness, like... It is that here are young people trying to make other people feel more comfortable. Like it's not, and, and what's being thrown at them is that they're addicted to indignation, it's that they're overly sensitive, that they're naive, that they're delicate, that they're sensitive snowflakes. Like let them change the world, if, like let, let them make people feel more safe in this world that we have. Thank you.